Awesome. Awesome. I want to do something a little different this morning and we'll see where it, we'll see where it goes. In the wee, wee hours of this morning, I had a dream. And I don't have many dreams like this. But it was so real and vivid. One of those, ever have one of those dreams where you, you wake up and you've, you're, you're trying to work out, was that a dream? Was that real? Was I there? Was I not? And it's so real that it sits with you. And I come to the conclusion very quickly that was not a... Uh, uh, we went out to a friend's Christmas party last night and we ate all kinds of... They just had like finger food, you know? And so I don't know what was whose fingers were in some of that food, but it wasn't one of those, you know, ham pizza and you have too much ham and you have a wheat. It wasn't one of those. And what happened in my dream was this. There was a grand piano sitting here in front of me. And you know, they have the lid on the grand piano and they lift up the lid. And I got, there's a guy standing here. And at first I saw him and there was another man standing over this side, sort of behind, and I didn't see him. And I saw this guy there and he's tuning this piano. And somehow I managed to get my head around the thing and I'm looking down close at the strings in the back of the piano. And they were just beautiful strings. You know, it was one of those pianos that you would expect to see in the foyer of some, you know, million and a half dollar a night hotel, that kind of thing. It was just schmick. And I'm leaning around and I'm looking at the strings and as I'm looking at it, this guy here is tuning the piano. He's, he's every each individual string he's he's tuning and I could tell straight away this is not just some guy tuning a piano this guy is the best piano tuner there is no one tunes a piano like this guy and I'm looking at these strings and he's so delicate and was just so gentle with what he was doing with the strings and then I looked up at him he was standing here and I looked like my eyes went from the strings to him and he had tears in his eyes as he was tuning the piano and, and then all of a sudden I noticed while I'm looking at him, I heard a voice over here and I looked across and there was another gentleman there. And he said in such a beautiful way, he said to the guy that was tuning, he said, no, no, that's too low. Tighten it up a bit more. And there was such unity between these two guys. It, it's hard to understand. It was hard for me to put into words. I just, it was almost like these two guys are one guy. And they're working together and they're tuning this piano. And it was so, so important to get the perfect amount of tension because they wanted to strike the key and make the perfect sound. Each string was put where it was put to make a certain sound and the sound had to be perfect. It had to be 100% right. And I could see in the tears in this guy's eyes that he just... Everything he was doing was to get the best note he could possibly get out of each individual string as a tune. And then I thought, God, that's us. And you're the piano tuner. And the way that you get the perfect note out of each of us is by adjusting the tension. And sometimes you wind the tension tighter for no other reason than This string is designed to bring out a perfect note. And I've got to tighten the tension on that string if I want to get the perfect note out of it. I'm not trying to break the string. I'm not trying to destroy the string. I know exactly what that string is capable of. And so I'm going to put the right amount of tension on to get the perfect note out of that string. That's what I'm doing. And then at other times, you loosen the tension on the string. Uh, if you've seen these guys when they warm up with their guitars, though, sometimes you're tightening the strings to get the perfect note. And sometimes you're backing off a little bit and, and releasing the tension. But the tension is coming and the tension is going. But the tension has a purpose and that purpose is to bring out the note for which that particular string was created to create. And I felt like God said that there will be people here this morning and Your year, 2021 for you has been, you've been like that string and you've felt the tension and it's come in waves where where, where it gets tightened 
And maybe you haven't fully understood that there's a purpose in the tensioning, that God uses the tensioning. He uses the tensioning to bring out of you the best. That which brings tears to his eyes when he hears that note. It touches the heart of the piano maker. He tunes it to perfection, then he stands back and he plays and he's emotionally moved by the beautiful sounds that are being made by these strings that he's perfectly tensed up and released and so on. And I felt like God said for some of us here this morning, that's what 2021 has felt like. It's just been this tensioning. And sometimes the tension that's pulled nice and tight, other times it's kind of backed up. But it's been a year of being tuned. It's been a year of, 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 of the strings being stretched and flexed. But it's the end game is not the tension, the tension, the tensioning and that. That's not the end game. That's just the process. The end game is to produce the perfect note that you were put here for. And I have this feeling that 2022 is going to be a year where many of those strings are going to have a chance to play that perfect note. That, that God's been tuning and tightening and releasing. But 2022, there are going to be people that are going to look back and go, I, I feel like I'm playing that note now. I feel like that, I feel like the life is, is, is there, the sound is coming back. I'm making a difference. I'm in harmony. And then all of a sudden these examples began to come to me. And I thought about a guy in the Bible called uh, Joseph. Anyone know a young fella called Joseph? Anyone read about Joseph in Genesis 37? I think it is. And, and you know, Joseph is, Joseph's got a tune that he's created to make. He's got a sound that's going to come out of him. He's just a little bit cocky and arrogant and not very wise. And has to learn a few life lessons in order to actually get to that place. And he makes this decision for whatever reason to gather his brothers together and go guess what I had a dream last night boys there's all these corns of wheat standing up and one was for me and there was one for each of you and guess what happened boys they're going right yeah what happened all of your corn bowed to my corn bad move Joseph bad move his brothers didn't take too kindly to it those of you that know the story they actually ended up dumping him in a pit and then selling him off to slave traders and you know the rest of his life it's just it's tension isn't it there's this this tightening and loosening there's this adjusting he spends time in prison he's accused of, of of sexual harassment of a young lady who happens to be married to a really powerful man he he he, he, he makes friends in prison then when they get out they forget about him he's got this story that's this constant tightening and loosening of these strings and in the end he lands in the place where he's meant to be. And yes, he does. In the end, his brothers come groveling to him because he finds himself in Egypt and he's in control of all of the food of the whole land through, through all the tensioning and the tightening and the loosening. God gets him eventually, gets him to not only the place that he needed to be, but to be the person he needed to be. Not only the physical position, but the heart position that he needed to have. Can you imagine if he still had control of, 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 at the end of the story, had control of all that food and his brothers came then? First thing I would have said is, <laughs> you remember that dream I had? <laughs> Who's laughing now, boys? But he doesn't. He doesn't even tell them. He feeds them, and as a result of that, the Jewish nation begin to thrive again. His family's saved. I think about a guy called Moses. And I don't know if you're aware of this. Most people think that Moses received his call from God when he was standing at the feet of a burning bush. That's not true. That's actually not true. If you go back and you read in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen, the martyr, this great man of God who again died, was murdered, was stoned to death simply because he believed the Jesus story. It's recorded in the, in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is not a book. It's an ancient historical document documenting the first 30 years of this thing called the church. That's what it is. We read this thing and go, oh, it's a religious book. Forget the religious book stuff. This was not written by religious people. It's not a religious book. It's a collection of ancient documents that have been compiled together to make it nice and easy for us when we come on a Sunday and carry it under our arms. When these guys wrote this thing, they never envisioned one day we're going to be part of a big religious book. 
They weren't thinking like that. They were just recording the facts as they knew it, recording what they felt God was saying, recording what they saw, recording what the people he interviewed told them. But in Acts chapter 7, it's recorded that Stephen, before he gets martyred, he gives the Jewish religious leaders a history of Israel. And if you go and read it, you can see, you can just imagine them all smug and pious as he goes along, and our forefathers did blah, 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 and they're like, yes, yes. And then right at the end, he turns on him and says, you brood of vipers, <laughs> you suckers, you killed Jesus. He was there. All the stuff I just told you about was pointing to him, and you missed the boat. It's the end of Stephen. It's funny though, 2,000 years later, we still know who Stephen is. I wouldn't have a clue who threw those stones. God's got an amazing way of doing what he wants to do. But as he's speaking to them, he says this in, in Acts chapter 7. He actually says that Moses, who, long story short, was, was a Jew, but ended up being brought up by Pharaoh in Egypt, adopted. One day he's walking around, and of course by this stage the Jewish people are all slaves in Egypt, and Egypt are getting their pound of flesh out of them, making them do all the hard work. One day he sees a Jew being mistreated by an a Egyptian slave driver. And he takes matters into his own hands, and he gets into a bit of fisticuffs, and, and it says he, he killed the Egyptian. But Stephen says that when that happened, Moses was actually thinking that this Israelite would turn around and realize that he was sent of God to save them. You read it in Acts chapter 7. So Moses knew before the burning bush moment that he was called to lead Israel out. He knew that. He, he had a sense of what his life was about. He knew what tune he was meant to play. But he wasn't ready yet. He wasn't ready yet. And so from that, of course... The Jews find out about it, and then they sort of pull back from him. The Egyptians find out about it. He's fearing for his life, so he takes off for 40 years, disappears. We don't know a lot of what happened there, but next time we find him, he's just a herder. He sees his bush burning, he approaches the bush, and everybody thinks that's when he had his call. But according to Stephen, he, was, he, knew, he knew what he was, he was meant to play before that. But guess what? He wasn't ready. So I can imagine those 40 years, there was a bit of tensioning, a bit of tightening, a bit of loosening, things going on. So that not only could he land where he was meant to land, but he'd be the person he was meant to be when he got there so he could play the tune and the note that God wanted him to play with his life. So many other stories that we could talk about. Jesus. The writer of Hebrews actually mentions about Jesus. He says that Jesus actually uh, learned obedience through the things he suffered so that he could become the perfect sacrifice that he was. Isn't that interesting? Even Jesus went through some tightening and some tension, some things in his world. And maybe you know the tune that you're meant to play. And, and maybe 2021 has been a bit of a slap in the face. Maybe you're standing here at the end of 2021 and you feel like you're further away from that tune than you were at the start. Anyone ever feel like that? I feel like I'm further away than I was at the start. Well, I feel like God wants to encourage you today that that's not the case. The tightening and the tension, the tuning that's taking place is all because God knows that perfect tune and he's getting ready to strike the key on the piano. I want to do something a little bit different this morning. We don't normally do things this way. If you, if, if, as I'm talking to you, if you feel like this, the, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, I want to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to, to hop up out of your chair and I'm going to ask you just to come up the front and I want to get some people to come up and pray for you this morning. As I said, I don't, I don't have dreams like that a lot. That's not what I have. I've actually got a, a message here that I want to share this morning. But, you know, I just feel like it's important this morning that some of you know that the tensioning and the tightening is God. And He's doing it because He loves you. He's doing it not because you passed your use by day. He's not doing it because, well, I've got no other use for you now. So you can just suffer and go through all this stuff. He's doing it because he knows that there's purpose and value. He knows that he has something for you. He knows what that thing is. God's a loving God, a caring Father. That's hard for some of us to understand because we didn't have that in the natural as children. There was always ulterior motives. 
God in heaven is not like that. He's not like that. And it doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made or how many times you've blown it. I believe in a God that is very, very gracious. And I may at times delay what he wants to do, but I, I believe I believe that it takes an awful lot for God to get to the point to go, you've missed your opportunity. And I don't believe anybody in this room has missed that opportunity. So if that's you this morning, I'm, I, I know it, I don't want you to feel embarrassed or anything, but I, I just believe as we respond, it's an act of faith to get up and to come up the front. It's simply an act of faith. And, and, and it says, Peter, I think it was Peter, says that, that, that God resists the proud, but he gives incredible grace to the humble. There's something about, 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 about acting in faith and humility that opens a door and the Holy Spirit floods in. And it also says that the enemy flees. I believe in God, but I also believe there's a devil. It's not an equal and opposite force. God wins every single day of the week. Every day of the week. God is the creator. The devil we talk about, he's a created being. Don't give him more glory than he deserves. But he'll sit there and he'll try to stop you responding to God. He'll sit there and he'll try to hold your heart back. He'll try to hold your person back. He'll try to tell you that, oh, you know, that little thing you're feeling inside, it's not God. Those little butterflies, that little thing going on in your heart right now, that's the Holy Spirit. That's how God communicates. That's, what, that's God's way of getting our attention. Whenever we respond to God, He floods in. So if that's you, I just want to ask you to come on up. Just come on up. Don't be embarrassed. Don't worry about other people in the room. It's got nothing to do with other people this moment. And if you're sitting there and it's not you, I want you to pray for these people that are coming up. I want you to pray for these people. 